Hello everybody, welcome back to the Martial. Uh, today we're gonna be watching The Battle of Waterloo by Epic History TV. Um, yeah, I I've, I um, have read a lot about the Battle of Waterloo. I visited the battlefield and yeah, it's a fascinating battle. So um, yeah, let's just get right into it. If you are, aren't already, uh, please consider subscribing and perhaps also liking the video. But anyway, let's get onto it. April 1814. For ten years, one man has dominated Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French. Under his military genius, France conquered an empire that spanned the continent. But finally, he has been defeated by a grand coalition of his enemies. Napoleon is forced to abdicate and exiled to the tiny island of Elba. While the Bourbon monarchy is restored to France in the corpulent form of Louis XVIII. But rumors soon reach Napoleon that France would welcome his return. The French people have little love for the monarchy or its hangers on, the very people whose excesses led to the French Revolution 25 years before. He also learns that at the Congress of Vienna, his. So, um, yeah, that's absolutely true. Many things happen right after Napoleon is forced to abdicate and goes to Elba. Many things, um, it, the, um, the economy crashes because the British introduce uh, the British who are occupying parts who are in who are in France. They um, they introduce pre, um, British produced industry products, which cause the French economy local the French local economy to crashes crash. There is also the problem with. Um, Many veterans don't like the the monarchy. They are often looked over for a promotion. Um, it is said that there is a higher chance of becoming an officer and getting promoted if you haven't done anything in the last couple of 25 years, because then you are more loyal to the king. You are haven't served Napoleon that way. So many of the Napoleonic officers are being ignored and the soldiers lose a lot of their money, a lot of their privileges. And the French people just generally don't like the emigres that are coming back to France and nobles who are coming back and the church gets more influence again and that kind of stuff. Many things, many of the Napoleonic principles and revolutionary principles are kind of being uh, thrown away again. So many people begin to miss Napoleon because of that, especially the army. The enemies are locked in bitter dispute over the future of Europe. Napoleon decides to act. After just 10 months in exile, he returns to France, where the troops sent to arrest him rally to his cause instead. So um, it was the perfect time to escape because um, Neil Campbell, the British officer who kept an eye on him, he was going to Lenovo, Li Livorno, I think that's how I said, in Italy to uh, meet with his doctor. It could also be because his mistress was in town, maybe that was it, but yeah, so he escaped while he was gone, and um, and yeah, he, um, and it was also because the coalition actually talked about moving him to another island, St. Helena and other islands were being mentioned as potential place he could be, and um, yeah, he lands with just 1,026 soldiers, 44 cavalry, and I think only 6 cannons, maybe only 2, I, I, 2 or 6, um, and yeah, he, um, he arrives on his ship, Lee in Constance, um, luckily doesn't encounter any pretty ship. He does encounter a French ship, which asks, how is the big man doing on the island? And he very discreetly says to the other ship, uh, he's doing quite fine. Yeah. Um, they, they didn't really see him on board. The soldiers were hiding in uh, below decks, but, uh, yeah, and Grenoble. That's the famous example, the thing you're seeing right here. Um, the soldiers defected en masse to him. Some of the officers did not, but the vast majority of soldiers defected after they saw him and they saw the medal of the Legion of Honor and they saw and they heard La Marcielle being played and all those things. And yeah, eventually the king will send Marshal Ney, very popular general during the Napoleonic Wars, to stop Napoleon 
But even he, who has, and he has been criti- and he has been critical of Napoleon. Even he eventually decides to join Napoleon anyway. So um, yeah, there's also an attempt at in uh, Lyon for the king, uh, for Charles, uh, the king's brother, to make the soldiers declare him. Um, uh, to say, I think they should say God save the king or something like that. But instead, they begin to yell yeah, revolutionary and Napoleonic slogans. And eventually, the king is forced to flee the flee the city. Yeah, it's just disaster. Everybody, the entire army deflects deflects on mass basically. Most of France soon follows suit, but in Vienna, the coalition immediately put their differences to one side. They declare Napoleon an outlaw and mobilize their forces for war. Napoleon knows he must act boldly before the coalition launches a coordinated invasion of France. He counts on winning a quick victory and then negotiating peace from a position of strength. He targets the... This is not to sound nitpicky, but I, the borders are kind of weird. They have, France didn't have Belgium at this time. But anyway, that minor mistake, all right. Coalition armies within easiest reach. Prince Blücher's Prussian army and the Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Allied army, both camped in Belgium. Napoleon's force is a match for either coalition army on its own, but he'll be heavily outnumbered if they're able to join forces. So he must keep them apart and defeat each in turn. Classic Napoleon strategy. He did it in Italy. He did it in uh, Austria. He did it basically everywhere. Get in between the armies. If you're outnumbered, hit them separately. Isolate them and de- defeat them before they can unite their strength. A classic Napoleon's, Napoleonic strategy. Napoleon's army crosses the frontier near Charleroi, intending to drive a wedge between the two coalition armies. The next day, Napoleon sends his left wing under Marshal Ney to take the crossroads at Quatre Bras. There's a lot of criticism by some people who argue that Wellington was in Brussels at the time when Napoleon crossed the river. He was aware of what was happening, but he was at the Duchess of Richmond's ball. He was indecisive because there have been reports at Mons that they may attack. There have been cavalry skirm- a few cavalry skirmishes in Mons, in the area of Mons. So there were fears that he might outflank the British supply lines. That doesn't really make any sense if he would do that, because if he did that, if he outflanked the British, the British would be forced to join with the Prussians and move towards the Prussians, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of the campaign. But still, um, he was afraid what would happen. And... Um, so Wellington stays at the Dutch of Richmond Ball, and it's only when he knows for certain Napoleon is moving towards uh, the Brussels that he tries to, that he begins to march out to defeat him. There, Ney clashes with Wellington's army, still scrambling into position. The Allied troops fight off a series of French attacks and just manage to hold their ground. The same day, Napoleon attacks Blücher's Prussian army with his main force near the village of Ligny. The battle is a brutal slugging match, but the French emerge triumphant. The 72-year-old Blücher leads a cavalry charge in person and has his horse killed under him. He only just escapes capture. The- he was nearly ridden down, and it was only because a, a soldier threw I think it was a cloth or something like that, like a something, a, a uniform or something like that, on him, so that the French cuirassiers didn't see him, see who he was, because he was covered up. If that if that had not happened, he would probably have died there or get captured. And he was kind of ridden over by a bunch of horses. Yeah, he was a tough guy, a bit insane. Um, Blucher, he believed that he was um, 
at one point he believed that he was pregnant with a French infantryist. Uh, no, a, he was pregnant with an elephant whose uh, mother uh, or father, whatever, was a was a f- French arti- infantryist. Infantry was a French infantryman. So yeah, um, that is. Um, yeah, he was kind of insane, but a very good general and loved by the soldiers. But um, one thing I want to comment on here is the fact, the reason why they attack Katabra is because they, um, the whole point is that the armies get united, right? So, um, so if they can take the crossroad, the British, then they can march towards, go along the Nivelle road, march towards the Prussians. So it's crucial that this crossroad is taken before, Otherwise, they can go over to the Prussians and help them. The plan was that Ney would occupy the Mons Road, then move over and then send forces to help um, uh, Napoleon at at, uh, at Ligny. That doesn't happen because Ney is cautious. Ney had fought against Wellington at Busaco and gone into a trap, so he was very cautious and did not really take any initiative. Afraid that Wellington might set off a trap. He, uh, he should have taken more initiative, but he didn't. Uh, so instead, he said, Napoleon orders first corps under Jean-Baptiste Doreau to, mo- uh, to march over and help the, at the Battle of Ligny. He arrives late, late in the evening. Doesn't get into position. He ends up like somewhere here. He's supposed to attack the Prussians here, around here. But um, he's called back by Ney and then moves all the way back again. And, um, yeah, a bit of a disaster for, for that. So the first corps just marches around, not really doing anything. The Prussian army retreats, but it is not broken. Napoleon sends his right wing under Marshal Grouchy to keep them on the run and turns his own attention to Wellington's army. The British general doesn't receive news of Blücher's defeat until the next morning at which point he orders a retreat through heavy summer showers to a position eight miles south of Brussels, near the village of Waterloo. There he receives a promise from Blücher that the Prussians will march to his aid the next morning. So Wellington decides to stand and fight. So Wellington had been named, after the war in 1814, he had been named ambassador to France. And on his way from the Netherlands down to Paris, he had actually seen Waterloo, the area at Mont-Saint-Jean. I think that that's how you say Mont-Saint-Jean. And um, yeah, um, he he sees it, and it's a perfect position in his eyes to def- to defend. Uh, it's this hill, large hill, that is kind of like shaped like an eye in a way. There are two hills that kind of uh, sh- that are shaped like an eye in a way and um, he thinks that you can hide forces behind one of the hills and uh, combined with the roads and the two far and the three farms in the area he believes that he can be a very strong defense position as we are going to see Wellington has chosen his battlefield with care his troops are behind a gentle ridge which will give them some shelter from French cannon fire his right flank is anchored on the farmhouse of Hougoumont, his center on the farm of La Haye Sainte, and his left on the farm of Papillot. All three are fortified and garrisoned with elite troops. Wellington's men need every advantage they can get. The opposing armies are roughly equal in size, but his is a ragtag mix of British, Dutch, and German troops many of whom have never seen combat before. They will have to hold off Napoleon's army of veterans until Prussian reinforcements arrive, or the battle, and probably the war, will be lost. So there are, it's a very, as he says, there are a lot of different people in the British army. The, many of the veterans in the British army are right now in, are right now in America to fight against... Um, fight in the war in 1812 that war is concluding so many of the officers are returning and i immediately shipped over to the to belgium to help um so a lot of them are are germans some are from the king's german legion which is a 
also a veteran group of soldiers from uh, the war on the Iberian Peninsula. But um, there are also new Her- Hanoverian troops who are not very skilled. Um, and then there are a bunch of Dutch soldiers. And not only are there Dutch soldiers, but there are also French-speaking Belgians. In fact, uh, Napoleon had smuggled, some of the French had smuggled uh, propaganda over uh, into Belgium to try to convince the French population, the French-speaking population in Belgium, to join the French. And um, some of them are even veterans from um, the Napoleonic Wars. I think one guy from Mont Saint-Jean, the village where, uh, close to water, uh, to the, fi- the battlefield, that village actually had one soldier who fought for Napoleon's army, I'm pretty sure. Or maybe more. I, something like that. But, um, so yeah, this area is, had previously fought for Napoleon. And so there are some loyalty issues. And, um, there are, many of them are wearing, um, old French uniforms that, um, that cause friendly fire, uh, on the battlefield. So yeah. Sunday dawns bright and fair. Napoleon has ordered Marshal Grouchy to pursue the Prussians and keep them busy, while he defeats Wellington's army at Waterloo and opens the road to Brussels. But it's Grouchy. His job is, uh, Grouchy's job is to get between the armies. It's kind of vaguely written to him, uh, poorly written to him, but that is his job. Who gets pinned down, fighting the Prussian rearguard at Wavre. The main Prussian force eludes him and is already marching to Wellington's aid. And this basically cost Napoleon uh, the battle. Wellington said himself, give me Blue or give me Knight. So essentially, uh, the arrival of the Prussians kind of saved Nap- uh, Wellington in this scenario. And, it very mu- and I would say it's very much the thing that settles the battle. Uh, and uh, it gives the British the victory. At Waterloo, Napoleon delays his attack, waiting for the ground to dry, which will make movement easier for his troops. But he the also, lo- he also takes a nap while it gets dry. I'm pretty sure he does that. Lost hours will later prove costly. The battle begins around 11 a.m. when Napoleon orders a feint against Wellington's right flank at Hougoumont. He hopes Wellington will commit his reserves here, drawing them away from the center where the main blow will fall. But o- Again, classic Napoleon. Attack one part of their line, so they weaken other parts of their line, and then blast through them. That's classic Napoleon. But Napoleon doesn't, and Wellington doesn't send his reserve, he doesn't do that. Gamal's British and German defenders cling on desperately throughout the day. At one point, the French force their way through the main gate, but it's shut behind them, and the intruders are all killed. So, well, in- so what happens is that, essentially imagine, first they attack head-on uh, the divisions of Fao and Jerome, by the grace of God, King of Westphalia and Prince of Montfort and Prince of France, Napoleon's brother, Jerome Bonaparte. Essentially, they attack head-on the 6th and 9th division. They attack head on. However, they notice, they notice that um, the, the gate, the, the northern gate, which is the gate uh, towards the British army, it's open because it's the way, it's the way where, it's a gate where ammunition is coming through from the British army down to Hukumont. So they move around and go through the northern gate. That again is wide open. Um, and so the the French are pulling in, pulling in, pulling in through the gate. But luckily, a few soldiers, I think only two, two or three, are able to get behind the gate somehow and close the gate. Every French soldier, except a drummer boy, dies uh, after the, the gates are closed and they are just massacred in there by the British. Wellington later calls it the decisive moment of the battle. 
Around noon, 80 French cannon open fire against the main Allied line. Most of Wellington's men are out of sight on the reverse slope, but many cannonballs still find their mark, smashing bloody holes in the Allied ranks. There are also howitzers, essentially cannons that most cannons fire like this. Fire like, fire like this. Howitzers fire like this. So it's good for going over walls. So they fire. So imagine they fire up and down and hit some of these men's men behind the hill. At 1.30 p.m., Napoleon sends in his infantry. The French columns are met by disciplined musket fire and then charged by British heavy cavalry. Uh, this attack is huge. 18,000 men. It's the first corps, Jean Baptiste de Roux, come there along, who leads the who leads the assault. Basically, they do this weird formation where they do an echelon attack, where one division hits at a time. So one division, one division, one division, and one division goes hits one at a time, um, like almost like a staircase in a way, and um, and essentially. They um, are they are in this huge formation, where they have aligned their regiments in a line, and then and then another regiment behind, and another regiment, and another regiment. So sorry, battalions, one battalion, one battalion behind each other, side by side. So essentially, you have twenty four um, men behind each other in in a huge line, and this is to count. This is kind of to create a column because a big problem for the French is that they use columns columns but um, they are not very good at firing lines are better for that so this is a compromise essentially but they are blasted by British artillery and judged down by um, by cavalry and um, they also attack La Hissante the French and begin the siege there the French columns are met by disciplined musket fire and then charged by British heavy cavalry The French attack disintegrates as Napoleon's men try to save themselves from the crushing hooves and flashing sabres. Scores of Frenchmen are ridden down and two of their famous Eagle standards are captured. But the British cavalry, exhilarated by success, charge too far. They become scattered, their horses blown. At their most vulnerable, they're countercharged by French cavalry and suffer terrible losses. Among the dead, Major General Sir William Ponsonby, commander of the Union Brigade. They attack. They attack by lance, lanceniers, uh, ho French horse riders, with lances. In fact, the British were so impressed by the lances that um, they actually would make their own lance re regiments after the war. And um, and yeah, no. Sir William Ponsonby dies. His uh, cousin, I think, is his cousin, Frederick Ponsonby. He would have his horse shot under him, um, get stabbed by a French lancer. By a French lancer, he would then uh, get ridden over by the cavalry charge. He would be used as a as a cover for a French uh, for a French uh, skirmisher, and. Uh, and is tramped over by um, by the British advance later in the fight, but he will survive despite the fact that his lung is pun that one of his lungs are pun uh, is punctured is punctured. Around 4 p.m., Marshal Ney thinks he sees the Allies begin to retreat, and leads a mass cavalry charge to drive home the advantage. But Ney is wrong. The Allied infantry are ready, formed in hollow squares, with bayonets fixed. The French cavalry can't break into these impregnable formations. They can only circle impotently until they retreat or are shot from the saddle. Ney's failure to support this attack with either infantry or artillery is a serious blunder. He does actually try. A forgotten detail is that is there is actually another attack. 8,000 men 
of the divisions of Bachelou, I think that's his name, and Foy actually attacks here. But they are cut down by British inf infantry fire. It's around 8,000 men that attack. I think they attack right here. And that happens at the end of this cavalry charge. Meanwhile, Blucher's Prussians have begun to arrive. They capture the village of Plancenoit, threatening Napoleon's flank and forcing him to send reserves to recapture it. Around he sends Lupo, I think that's Lupo, he sends at first, and then eventually General Duhesme. And Duhesme, who is famous for his book that details about, that is about light infantry, which would become one of, his book would become one of the most, uh, would become one of the most popular books in the subject of light infantry in the, for the next 100 years. He would die here. He would get mortally wounded and then die two, two days later to Hesme. Around 6 p.m., French infantry finally capture the farmhouse of La Haye-Sainte in the center of the battlefield. It allows the French to bring forward artillery and blast the Allied squares from close range. They can't miss. This was devastating for the for the British. They nearly, they really, they nearly broke because of it, and it was incredibly devastating for much of the British line because they have artillery right in front of them. It was absolutely de devastating. And it was here, I think it was around here, where Blucher says, "Give me." Uh, no, sorry, not Blucher. Wellington says, "Give me Blucher or give me night." The closely packed formations and casualties quickly mount. It begins to seem that if Wellington's army doesn't retreat, it will be killed where it stands. But the situation for Napoleon is also desperate. The Prussians are arriving in force, and he's running out of men to throw against Wellington's army. So he turns to his ultimate reserve, the elite Imperial Guard, the most feared troops in Europe. At 7.30 p.m., 3,000... He doesn't send the old guard in. And it's pretty weird that it has become so famous, the attack of the Imperial Guard, because that was actually the smallest attack done by, done by Napoleon that day. It was only 3,700 men, compared to Foy's attack of 88,000, or Jean-Baptiste de Rose of 18,000. It was actually pretty small. I don't know if it could have really done any difference, but it is the most experienced part of the army, but it hasn't really seen battle for many years by this point. Thousand of these battle-hardened veterans march past their emperor and across the corpse-strewn battlefield towards the Allied center. Wellington's redcoats rise to meet them and pour devastating volleys of musket fire into their ranks. When the Allies fix bayonets and prepare to charge, the Imperial Guard wavers and then retreats. Wellington, sensing victory, orders a general advance. About the same time, the Prussians recapture Plans Noir. News of the Imperial Guard's defeat and rumors of encirclement by the Prussians sweep through the French ranks. Panic breaks out, and the French army flees the battlefield. Only Napoleon's old guard maintain their discipline, mounting a heroic but doomed rearguard action. And I think it's Campone, Campone or whatever his name is. Uh, the idea that he smell, he said "mad shit" in French. Uh, to the British uh, guard, uh, no, sorry, not guard, army. That is probably wrong. He probably said something along the lines of, uh, the guard dies, he doesn't surrender, or something like that. Napoleon himself is forced to abandon his carriage and barely escapes the pursuing Prussian cavalry. The battle is won. The Duke of Wellington and Prince Blücher meet and congratulate each other outside Napoleon's former headquarters, an inn called La Belle Alliance. 
Blücher thinks it's the perfect name for their shared victory, but Wellington prefers the more English-sounding Waterloo, where he has his own headquarters. La Belle Alliance, the beautiful victory. Uh, no, not victory, alliance. Something like, like that. It actually becomes known as La Be The Belle actually becomes known for many years as La Belle Alliance in Germany. I believe in, Fran in France, it's still it's known as Belle of Mont Saint-Jean because of the city of the town of Mont Saint-Jean that is very close, closer to the battlefield than Waterloo is. And I believe it's actually not pronounced Waterloo, it's pronounced Fatalu or something like that, I think. The Battle of Waterloo was, in the words of the Duke of Wellington, a damned near run thing. It was also one of the bloodiest battles of the age. Around 50,000 men were killed or wounded, 23,000 coalition casualties, 27,000 French. Due to an appalling shortage of medical care, many of the wounded were left lying on the battlefield for several days. Napoleon was utterly defeated. Unable to raise another army, he surrendered to the British. They transported him to a second exile on the tiny remote Atlantic island of St. Helena. This time there was no escape. He died there six years later. Waterloo marked the beginning of a period of relative peace in Europe. There were no wars between the great powers for 40 years, and the British would not fight on the continent for another 100 years, until the summer of 1914. Forty years after the battle, a pioneer in the new art of photography captured these remarkable images. They're veterans of Napoleon's armies, by then all old men in their 70s and 80s. Among them, Sergeant Tanya of the Imperial Guard, Moray of the 2nd Regiment of Hussars, and Verlin of the 2nd Guard Lancers. These faces are a tantalizing link to the dramatic events that shaped the course of history two centuries ago. That was, that was incre incredible. Really good. Yeah, full credit to Epic History TV. They do a fantastic job on the Napoleonic Wars. But anyway, um, see you guys later. Uh, please subscribe or like the video if you liked, if you found it enjoying. Anyway, thank you for watching. See you guys next time.